In this series, I'm doing a deep dive into the ZX80 and ZX81 video circuit, and so far, we've already covered quite a bit of the design. In this video, I want to have a closer look at the sync generation circuit, and I'll move on to the concept of a display file. Originally, I used the complement A instruction for sync generation. It turns out, having freedom over opcode bit 5 is pretty important when writing code. Now, the Z80 is a very clever CPU, and there are two ways of accessing external devices. One through the main memory, which is 64k bytes in size. This is usually RAM or ROM. But the Z80 also has a separate I.O. space for peripherals. This space only has 256 port addresses, but it's independent from the main memory. The main signals controlling the memory and ports are shown here. MREC bar, I.O. REC bar, read bar, and write bar. These signals are all active low. A memory read occurs when MREC bar and read bar are asserted, while a memory write occurs when MREC bar and MWrite bar are asserted. During an I.O. operation, the I.O. REC bar signal is asserted, and the port number is placed on the address bus. For the IN instruction, the I.O. REC bar and READ bar signals are asserted, and for the OUT instruction, I.O. REC bar and WRITE bar are asserted. Using I.O. ports, I'm going to generate the SYNC signal with a flip-flop and a 74HC138 3-8 decoder. The three select inputs for the decoder come from A0 to A2. Enable is the IO rec bar signal directly from the CPU. I'll take the first two outputs from the decoder and connect them to the set and reset signals going into the 74HC74 flip-flop. When IO rec bar is high, outputs 0 and 1 will both be high. The set and reset signal going into the flip-flop are both active low, so this will leave the state of the flip-flop unchanged. When we execute an out zero instruction in our code, this will drive IO rec low with the address zero. This will send output zero low, which will set the flip flop Q signal and reset Q bar. Then when IO rec goes high again, the status of the flip flop remains unchanged. Sometime later, we execute the out one comma A instruction. Output one will go to zero. This is connected to the reset bar signal of our flip-flop. Q will go low and Q bar will go high. If I connect sync bar to Q bar, this means we can toggle our sync signal on and off using the out instructions. On the left, we see our original code using the complement A instruction for controlling sync, and now we can update it to use the out instruction. How does this circuit compare against the ZX80? Well, if I connect RD bar here, then this 74HC138 will decode the IN instruction. I can change this D-type flip-flop into an SR latch. And if I change the reset bar input to the SR latch to detect the OUT instruction, then I have a circuit for IN detection, a latch, and OUT detection. Let's compare. IN detection, latch, OUT detection. I've already wired in the 74HC74, so I think I'll just stick with that for now. Note that this extra signal is to reset the line counter so it's synchronized with the code. At the moment, I use this circuit for both horizontal and vertical sync, whereas the ZX80 only uses it for vertical sync. It has a completely separate circuit for horizontal sync, which I'll go over in the next video. Now, I want to look at the idea behind a display file. The Z80 can address 64 kilobytes of main memory, but the ZX80 and ZX81 can only use half of this space from 0000 to 7FFF. Then, this lower copy of memory is mirrored in the upper half of the address space to form a shadow image. You can think of the memory address as being the CPU address minus the top bit. The memory can't tell the difference between 2000 hex and 8000 hex. After going to all the effort to unencumber the sync signal from opcode bit 5, I'm going to turn around and use bit 6 to control the no-op generator. But there's a catch this time. Bit 6 only controls the no-op generator when we're addressing the shadow memory. That is, for memory addresses above 8000 hex, where A15 is set. 
I didn't choose D6 and A15 arbitrarily. These are the actual signals the ZX80 uses. When we're in the lower half of the address space, then the data read from memory is just considered to be normal Z80 opcode and the no op generator is turned off. But for memory accesses above 8000 hex, when A15 is set, then bit 6 of the data determines what this byte's used for. If bit 6 is low, the no op generator is activated and the data is considered to be a character and sent to the character register. But for memory accesses above 8000, when bit 6 is high, then it's considered to be a Z80 instruction and the no-op generator is turned off. Which means the data goes through to the CPU. So why on earth would we possibly want to do this? Well, if we allow one byte per character, and we have 32 columns and 24 rows, then it takes up 768 bytes of memory from a machine that only has 1024 bytes in total. One of the things we notice with text, particularly with basic programs, is that there's a lot of empty space on the right hand side of the screen. It would be really helpful if we can figure out a way of not having to actually store this data in memory when we know it's blank. So we're going to need to do something different. The first thing I'm going to do is have the code for one scan line in ROM, and I'm going to name this our reference scan line. This code is similar to the scan line we used in the last video, but there are some differences and I'll go over those in a moment. Basically, it starts with a bunch of no ops during the active part of the scan line. Next, in the blanking period, it asserts hsync, decrements b, which is our line counter, and then d asserts hsync. This gives us a horizontal sync pulse of 15 clock cycles. Then, it checks to see if b's reached zero, which means we're at the bottom of the current text row. If it hasn't reached zero, we perform this relative jump, which takes us to a couple of lines of filler. We remove the return address from the stack, and we go back to our display file. I'll discuss the alternate path for the conditional jump in a moment. Now, here's the tricky bit. By using data bit 6, we can mix up code with text at the same time. This means, of course, that we're limited to opcodes that have bit 6 set. One instruction with bit 6 set is the call to subroutine instruction, which is opcode CD hexadecimal. This is very similar to the JSR instruction in the 6502, which I've got into great detail in this video link below. It even shows the microcode for this instruction. Anyway, back to the Z80. Bit 6 is set, the no op generator is turned off, and this instruction acts like a jump, except the address of the next instruction is stored on the stack. Houston, we have a problem. Because we push to and pop from a stack, this needs to be stored in RAM, and the design so far is ROM based. The RAM in the ZX80 is directly connected to the CPU address bus, but the data bus has to go through a bank of resistors to get to the CPU. This is exactly how our first ZIF socket's currently wired up. The 628128 static RAM has a very similar pinout to the 27C4001 EEPROM, so by changing just a couple of wires, I should be able to use the zip socket on the left for static RAM. I'll let it here in the schematic. For now, I'm going to implement a new data structure, which is similar to the one the Sinclair people called the display file. Hopefully this version is a little easy to understand. The information in this data structure is the text at the start of each row, and a call to the reference scan line, which finishes the scan lines. But the call needs to be offset by the number of characters already displayed. For an entirely blank scan line, we only need 3 bytes instead of 32, which means a blank screen only needs 72 bytes instead of 768. Note that I'm using the added constraint that every scan line must call this subroutine, even if it's empty, and this is to keep the timing consistent for all scan lines. This reduces the memory requirements from 768 bytes to 472 bytes for this piece of text. The way this works is, let's say the first row of text has 16 characters to display, then we offset our call to the reference scan line by 16 bytes. The next row of text has 32 characters, so we offset the call by 32 bytes. 
The third row of text has no characters at all, so we have a zero offset and we call the reference scan line starting at location 1000 hex. We set the HL register pair to point to the start of the display file in shadow memory, then we actually jump to this location. Because we're referencing the shadow copy, we jump to location A1000 in this case, A15 is set, then we look at bit 6 of each byte to decide whether it's a character or an instruction. In this case, the first 16 bytes are characters, so bit 6 will be clear for all of them, and the no-op generator will be active. The CPU will just see these as no-ops, and we scoot over all of these 16 characters in order. Next, we hit the call instruction, which has bit D6 set, so this passes through to the Z80. The address of the next instruction is pushed onto the stack, and the code jumps to location 1010 10 hexadecimal. Because we've jumped to location 1010, we actually skip the first 16 no-ops in our reference scanline routine. Then we execute another 16 no-ops in our reference scanline to set the overall count to 32 for the row. We don't actually execute a call here. This is just to account for the 17 clock cycles we took to execute the call instruction earlier in the scanline. We assert hsync. Decrement B, which is initially set to the number 8. Do you assert hsync? Again, I'm using this ordering to make the hsync signal 15 clock cycles wide. If B hasn't reached 0 yet, then we branch down to this no op at 102D. This no op and increment DE instruction are purely used to fill space and keep the timing accurate. Next, we see this pop DE instruction. This removes the return address placed on the stack by the call instruction and basically throws it away. We don't actually use the result of the DE register for any other purpose. The value in HL is unmodified from the last scan line and points to the start of the text that we just went over at location A1000 hex. We move over the same piece of text again with the CPU executing no ops. We do this a total of 8 times, so this represents the 8 scan lines required to render this block of text. Remember that we're also incrementing the line counter in hardware with each hsync pulse. On the 8th time we enter our reference scan line, B will be equal to 1, we turn on hsync, decrement B, then turn off hsync, but this time the decrement will set the zero flag, so we follow the alternative pathway when we hit the conditional relative jump instruction. We decrement C, which initially contains the value 24 in hexadecimal, the number of text rows in the image. If the C register hits 0, then we've finished the entire page, but if not, we set B to be the number 8. And then here's the really tricky bit. Move! Wake up, Rick! Rick! Wake up! <laughs> we pop the return address into HL this time instead of DE which means we don't throw away the return address. Instead, we jump to the return address location because this points to the start of the next row of text characters. We step over these characters with the no-op generator active. We call the reference scan line at location 1020 hexadecimal and push the return address to the stack. Again, this happens eight times. Then we move to the next line of text, which happens to be blank. We keep repeating this until we reach the bottom scan line of the bottom row of text characters in our display file. This time, we're calling the reference scan line when B and C are both equal to 1. When we decrement B, we go down the alternate pathway. We decrement C, which also sets the zero flag, and then we return to the routine calling display. Another advantage of a display file is that we have control over its size. Let's say we only have 256 bytes available for the screen image. What we can do is truncate the display file so that only the first couple of lines of text are displayed and fill the rest with blank lines. This way, we can keep our entire display file under 256 bytes. I'm sure anyone who's written some basic code on a 1K ZX80 or ZX81 will recognize this phenomena. I've programmed this code into an EEPROM as well as some code for handling vertical sync. Here it is. We should be able to put a ZX80 ROM into this machine pretty soon. This is all good and well, 
But old Sir Clive and his team had another trick up their sleeve. Instead of using the call instruction to mark the end of each text line, they used the halt instruction. This is a whole new level of trickery that I'll go over in the next video. I think that's enough for now, and I hope you're enjoying this deep dive into the ZX80 and ZX81 video circuit. 